Good morning, everyone. It's 10 02. I'll call the Lubbock City Council to order. We have a special work session today for the purpose of learning a presentation regarding and discussion about uh, impact fee land use assumptions, capital improvement plans, and next steps. Uh, the purpose of this hour long session this morning is to better prepare council for the uh, work session tomorrow evening, which is uh, the first of what will be uh, a couple of work sessions related to impact fees. That is scheduled for these very chambers tomorrow night at five o'clock. We have a hard stop at 11 today because of our COVID-19 press conference at 11.30. So with no further ado, I'll turn it over to Mr. Atkinson. Thank you, Mayor, City Council. Appreciate you joining us this morning. I know we were here just not so horribly long ago, but uh, what we'd like to do is kind of refresh everybody's memory. Um, bring us all back uh, online with what the process is as it relates to studying and potentially adopting your impact fees. Recall that this process is actually included in Plan Lubbock 2040 or your comprehensive plan. During that plan, it was directly stated to the council to consider implementing the impact fees for the roadways and to study such for water and wastewater. So today, uh, Jessica, are you starting first or do you want me to call Mike? Mr. Keenum, our city engineer will come up. Council, I believe you each have the presentation for today before you uh, and Mike will get us started. Mike. Thanks, Jared. So as, as Mr. Atkinson said, we're gonna do the work session. Just, just to clarify, tomorrow night will be a public hearing, not, not simply a work session, but a public hearing. I'm sorry, it's a public hearing. I, I know you've had a lot of meetings lately, so. Um, just wanted to do a quick overview for myself and then I'm gonna turn it over to the consultant to do the remainder of the presentation. This is an infographic that we've got on the city website that just kind of outlines what impact fees are. And so backing up, this is a new slide. A lot of the slides you're gonna see are gonna look similar to what we presented to y'all back in, in February at a work session. They're obviously being updated with, with new information, revised information. Um, and going back and understanding in the comprehensive plan, we looked at multiple different funding sources and mechanisms uh, at that time. And impact fees were ones that rose to the top. And as Mr. Atkinson stated, that was what was recommended in the comprehensive plan. So this committee is only looking at the impact fee portion and studying the technical pieces of that and making recommendations to, to this body. Um, as you look at impact fees and what they are, they're a one-time fee. And Mr. Whitaker with Kimley Horner is gonna get into more details of this, but just given that broad overview, one-time fee for new construction, new development, that helps offset the cost that the city pays for infrastructure to support growth. And so understanding that is the, the impact fee would pay a portion of the infrastructure cost for the proportional impact of that new development to the overall system. So not all of the cost, but a small portion of that. The ratepayers and taxpayers continue to pay the bulk of the cost. Um, but it would be an additional set of revenue for the city that we don't currently have. Another tool in the toolbox that's not available to us today. Um, as we look through this to understand the process before us in the public hearing tomorrow night, it's not the full study. It's just the first piece of the study. And so it's the land use assumptions and the capacity improvement plan. That's the only piece that's, that's for the public hearing tomorrow night. Not the maximum fee, not the specific cost of projects, but the list of projects and those assumptions. And so as a broad brush overview, what happens is we start somewhere. We start with a growth assumption. And what is the population gonna grow to be in the next 10 years? And so the comprehensive plan recommended a 2.5% growth rate. The committee, the SEAC committee, recommended also adopting that 2.5%. That becomes your ultimate decision on uh, what's in the plan. That is what is there. And so that 2.5% produces a population in increase in the next 10 years of about 77,000 people. And so you've got that additional people. Now we distributed those throughout the city based on the land use map, based on the current city limits, no annexation involved. And so we place those 77,000 people around the city limits. Where do they go? 
based on, again, where we've seen building permits, where we've seen trends, where we've seen plans for new things, where we want to see development occur. But they've got that's, those 77,000 people have to fit somewhere. And so that gets distributed through the different areas of town. Once you do that, then we develop the capital project list of now what kind of infrastructure do we need to support that growth? Water, sewer, and roadways are what we're looking at here. And so understanding these list of projects come from that growth assumption of 2.5%, where that distribution of people are, and then what kind of projects are needed to handle that volume of traffic or water and sewer infrastructure to support that increased growth. So that's the basis of what the public hearing is for tomorrow night. Not a maximum fee, not specific cost details of those. That's the next step. That's the next piece. And I know a lot of the concerns and questions have been on those details. We're not trying to hide any of that. We're just getting to that after we get to this point. The committee has moved forward with the assumption that we will go forward after tomorrow night. Um, uh, that entirely is rests with this body of whether we do that or not. But understanding is that a lot of the questions that have come up is not related to this piece, but to the next piece when we start doing policies of what is the maximum fee. This body has seen a, an estimated maximum fee back in February um, that kind of got the community engaged by seeing those numbers. That was a look ahead of what's coming. And so we'll see more of that today as we refine that even more. Um, but those are still based on waiting for what happens tomorrow night and the recommendations we get and, and the recommendations that th this body does. So with that, I want to turn it over to uh, Mr. Whitaker with Kimley Horn to, to go through this process a little further and diving down a little deeper into that. Jeff? Good morning, Mayor and Council. I'm excited to be here. I, I think after doing two or three months of online meetings, it's really nice to actually be in first person and see your face. And it's just a different feeling actually being in person. So I, it was actually, a, it's my first in-person meeting in, in a while, so I'm very excited. So I want to go over where we've been, why impact fees, a little bit of the basics, get into the components, the details that Mike just described, talk about the comparisons, and then the upcoming decisions that will be, have to be made. So one, one of the items from where we've been in prior meetings is um, we have a Capital Improvements Advisory Committee um, known as the SEAC. They've been working diligently, and I commend them. They've, they've actually been to all the meetings you've seen in front of you, but they've been working since really July of um, almost a year, July of 2019, kicking off and going through everything you see in front of you. As you see the meetings listed in front of you, the ones in black are really the meetings that we had that were really focused on what's, what you're seeing to happen tomorrow night. The meetings in red, as Mike mentioned, we kind of moved ahead just to have to start the discussion, see where we're going. The meetings in red that we've had recently are really about the future um, steps, but we wanted to have those discussions early to see kind of where we're heading. So we, um, several of those meetings have been posted online, so the video is available for people to watch if they choose to. Um, as far as council, we've met with you a few times. Um, most recently um, that I met with you was on February 11th. We gave you a similar presentation. And what I plan to highlight here is a, some of those slides, but more importantly, what's changed since February 11th too. So you can kind of see the impact that the advisory committee and some of the public comments we've had so far to date has had on the presentation. Um, just a, this is just a reminder, May 28th, the real focus tomorrow night is the public hearing on the service areas, land use assumptions, and capacity projects. That's the, really the fo focus. Tomorrow night does not improve the implementation of impact fee. And then also, any results that I'm showing you today, when I'll get to that part, any comments I've received from you tomorrow night could affect the results I show, because if we decide to move a project, change some growth projections, everything that I show you right now is preliminary. Um, so why impact fees? Mike did a um, good job of summarizing what came out of the comprehensive plan, Lubbock 2040. Um, there's really two different needs for transportation funding. There's really existing needs and future needs. A lot of times existing needs, you hear about operations and maintenance. That's kind of where we're standing today in this area of um, Lubbock, and you'll see on some of the slides, is most of your needs are like on the operation and maintenance sides. And when you get towards the outer peripheral of Lubbock, a lot of them are building new roads, capacity. Impact fees are really just targeting capacity. And really when your toolbox, as Mike mentioned, is um, to have growth pay for growth, there, we were looking for a toolbox, and there's multiple toolboxes. Impact fee is one of those tools for potentially growth pay for growth. Really what it does, it, it, it's accountable because state law tells us how to do it and outlines a specific process. So some of the reasons we do things, it's because we're following state law in that aspect. It's consistent with your goals in the conference and plan. Um, the idea is it to be equitable. In that meaning, if a developer was to develop the, you know, a restaurant in one part of the service area and another part of the service area, they would pay the same fee. Um, it's, everyone's treated the same. Equitable would be by, by meaning fair. It's predictable when we're done and council, if council decides to move forward and adopt the fee, 
you'll be able to pull up a spreadsheet online and figure out what your actual um, fee is. And it's proportional. Um, it's directly related to the traffic. A single family home pays a different dollar amount than a restaurant because a restaurant generates more traffic for transportation. Same thing with water. If you pull a bigger water meter, you pay a larger fee than if you pull a smaller water meter. So that's, that's the kind of why impact these sides. So a little bit about the current process. Um, the developers currently do pay and construct their interior infrastructure. So in a subdivision, they build the residential streets. They put in the water and wastewater pipelines. They do put the curb and gutter for arterial streets. So that's how they contribute to the curb and gutter. They, they do establish a curb and gutter line for arterial streets. The city currently pays from builds the arterial streets. The city typically provides water and sewer mains for developments to use. The developers will pay their portion through an assessment um, for the water and sewer lines that we're looking at as part of this process of impact fees would move forward. How would that change? Um, city currently provides water and wastewater treatment for the entire city. And um, the, one of the reasons this got brought up in Lubbock 2040 is the current practices have not allowed the city to keep up with development growth. They're kind of paying catch up to the development. Where the development's going, they have to go in and build the streets afterwards, trying to play a little catch up mode. So why is Lubbock pursuing impact fees? Um, roadways are funded through the generator fund. It's properties and sales tax. That's really the only source of funding for roadways right now. They're trying to diversify the toolbox. And really with that, it's, it's, it's hard to keep up without adding something else to that toolbox. Um, water and sewer fees are funded through existing user fees. And so existing users are paying for the growth components as well. So trying to supplement the existing users to pay for future users. And as part of the vetting process of Lubbock 2040, this was evaluated and impact fees was the best option to move forward with as Mike mentioned, there was a recommendation for roadway and the consideration for studying water and wastewater. So a little bit about the basics, just to get everyone on the same page. This is a one-time fee for new development. So this is for new growth, new trips, new water demand. It's a mechanism to recover infrastructure costs to serve new development, um, roughly proportional with mathematical exactitude. It's the only legal way in Texas to collect a fee that's flexible for the city to use it in the best interest for the development community. Um, they, by flexibility, they can put it on, spend it on the projects that are listed in the plan. Right now, Texas allows for water, wastewater, roadway, and drainage. They do, we're not studying drainage at this time, but those are the four things by state statute that we're allowed to look at. Other states have many other avenues of impact fees, but right now we're just focused on water, wastewater, and roadway. So what's payable? The simple way of everything that's payable is if you're building a project that's related to capacity, anything that's to deliver that project is um, impact fee eligible. Um, construction of a, the capital project, survey and engineering, debt service, uh, land acquisition costs. Um, one, you'll see one of the recommendations from the advisory committee about land acquisition costs in a little bit. Components that cannot be paid through the program is anything that's not identified on the plan, anything to do with existing demand, deficiencies. We can't fix existing issues. We can only provide for new growth. So service areas, um, we spent two meetings with the SEAC on service areas before they got comfortable going through multiple options. Um, what, what's really important about the service areas, it really, this really concept pertains to roadway, is state law defines the service area as a six mile, six mile, that's what it says. We interpret that as a six mile trip length, so we d divide up the areas of Lubbock to really be about approximately six miles in diameter. Um, and these were the areas that the SEAC and, and we worked towards to get. And there's eight total service areas throughout Lubbock, um, kind of on, try to make major streets kind of the div dividing line um, these are similar to what you saw. These haven't changed since February. These are the same service areas you saw in February. For water and wastewater, it's a little bit simpler. It's one system. Um, roadway is kind of an open system, so it's kind of goes everywhere. Well, water and wastewater, it's considered one system. You operate your water and wastewater kind of as one system, or a roadway, you may operate it project by project. So for water and wastewater, it's pretty common. Most cities across Texas has one service area for water and wastewater, and we recommend that for Lubbock as well. Um, the land use assumptions. This is a pretty important part of the aspect it establishes the infrastructure demands using the master plan. Um, what we were looking at the comprehensive plan, the future growth that was projected in the comprehensive plan, and wanted to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. And this, this slide really shows that um, what we saw over the last 10 years was approximately 2% growth. Um, what the comprehensive plan and what the growth projection that get, gets recommended, you'll see in the next slide, is 2.5%. So you'll see the, kind of the growth trend that's happened since 1990 and kind of what we're projecting through 2040 that's consistent with the recommendation in the comp plan. These were the tables we're looking at, and if you look at the chart on the right, you'll see how, the, in a high levels, how the growth was divided around 
the city of Lubbock. And as you can see, most of the growth is outside the loop. And this is the kind of the, the darker the red, the more growth there was. And we had to allocate that 2.5% across the city, so that roughly 77,000 individuals allocated, as you see across the city. And, we're, and a lot of times we think of this as service areas. So if you want to think of it in the roadway service areas, how we're allocating across the city, this gets a little bit more refined. This is the population growth across the city. One thing to do is we're all looking in the crystal ball where it would go. It's important to remember that impact fees are growth dependent. So if the growth does not occur as we plan, the project probably won't get built, but also the developer probably won't pay the fee. So if the growth isn't happening, the fee is not paid. If the growth is happening, the fee is paid. But based on our guidance, this is where we allocated the, the roughly 76,843 people across the city. And it kind of makes sense if you think about the growth. Um, service Area F had the largest growth that we saw in the area, as well as Service Area B had significant growth that we were seeing in the next 10 years. The capacity plans is another important piece that you're looking at tomorrow night. Um, it's based on your adopted master plans. So the roadway is based on your adopted th thoroughfare plan. The water is based on your adopted water master plan and wastewater, wastewater master plan. So really what we're trying to understand is what the next 10 years are. And you've done a lot of master planning with the comp plan as well as with the water and wastewater master planning to try to understand those needs. Really what we're trying to calculate at the end of the day is um, every project or every area has three really cost components. And this graphic um, spoke to a few of the, the folks I mentioned to, so I wanted to show it to you, is each of those cost components, there is a existing demand. So if there's a roadway out there today, there's traffic on the roadway today, there's an existing demand out there. We shouldn't charge for that existing demand. There's a future 10-year demand that's gonna be needed, so we can charge for that. That's the purpose of the impact piece, to look at the next 10 years. But then a lot of times for major infrastructure projects, we're not building like an elevated storage tank for the next 10 years, we're building it for the next 20 years. So a portion of that cost would be on the 10-year window. So if you think about each bucket, there's an existing cost, there's a 10-year cost, and there's a beyond 10-year cost. So right now, we're kind of looking at the total cost. So when you see some of these numbers, we're looking at the total cost. The next part is we're breaking those costs down to what buckets they need to be in. So we've developed the land use and population projections, as we just mentioned, with the 2.5%, and we're developing the 10-year capacity plans. What we're working on right now with the advisory committee is we're going through um, removing the costs associated with existing demand and tell them how that comes out. You'll see that today, but we're working through that with them and the credit calculation. Both the items in red that you see is not what we're talking about for the public hearing, just the items in green, those check marks, the 10-year capacity plans and the land use and population projections. So just to dive into a little bit of the details, um, I wanted to show two service areas for roadway. So roadway is a little bit different than water and wastewater. So the committee had two different approaches we discussed with them and we worked up quite a bit of time discussing this approach. One is that we looked at project specifics. The other one was we looked at what we called the universe of projects. And we wanted to take the universe of projects and narrow that down to what the cost would be in 10 years. And the reason we wanted to do that is to allow flexibility where the city could spend the money. If we decided to pick Quaker as the road and you really needed the money on university, that kind of hamstrings us for the next 10 years. But if we lump the universe of projects together and figure out what portion, what percentage of those projects, it kind of gave flexibility to the city. So I'm gonna walk you through that. We included new arterials, widening arterials, um, some completed arterials um, with excess capacity, so recently built roads that had been built in anticipation of growth, and some intersection improvements. When we looked at service area A, if you see the total cost of the capacity plan is $151.1 million. So it, to build out your entire network for that area of town, it's going to eventually cost $151 million in 2020 dollars without debt. Um, but we, if you remember that formula I just looked at, there's a breakdown for existing, 10-year cost and beyond 10-year cost. So in that area, we saw $18.3 million of existing needs. So we can't charge that for impact fees. So that $18.3 million is taken out. We also saw $95 million beyond the 10 years. This part of um, service area A, we don't anticipate building out in the next 10 years. So $95 million is beyond that 10-year window. So if you look at service area A, the number that's really important, that's not what we're talking about tomorrow night, but the number that's ultimately going to be really important is at $37.8 million. So in the next 10 years in service area A, we recommend allocating $37.8 million for growth in service area A. So that's going to be a really important number from this one. Um, similarly, just to show you another one, the reason I wanted to show you this one is service area A does not have any existing projects in it. Service area E has some existing projects. When you see the projects that are in green, if you're familiar with the area, those are projects that had been built recently that we were trying to recover some funds on. So if you look at this, and it's the same form as before, this. These are the two high growth areas in, in town, so they're, they're with lots of needs. 
So this one shows $129.5 million for total needs through build out. But we break that down into three categories again. $17.2 million needs for existing demands, $38.7 million need for the tenure, that 38.7 million being the important number, and then 73.6 million beyond the tenure needs. So that, that, that window is gonna continuously move. So in five years, if you were to update this, those numbers would change, so that number continuously moves. The most important number in here is, it just so happens to be about the same numbers at 38.7 million. And one of the things I felt, I mentioned earlier that I was gonna touch on is one of the decisions of the um, advisory committee was to remove right away from the cost of the projects. So that would be one of the elements that if right away was dedicated, it wouldn't be an offset to. So that was one of the policy, the decisions that they recommended is right away because it's currently been dedicated and given throughout the process of that. I just wanted to note this is right away was removed. That's one of the items that hadn't happened, I don't think, before the February 11th meeting. That was a result of some of the feedback we got back. So that's one of the changes that has happened is that we removed right away from the cost. So that's why when you see the numbers, you'll see they're a little bit lower than what we showed you probably in February 11th. It's because the right away has been removed. So breaking down each service area, uh, this is kind of the how you break down each service area by those three chunks. On the left side of this chart, where you see the line drawn to the left, it says included in the land use assumption of the capacity report. What you see in the report that's being presented to you tomorrow night, or the public hearing for tomorrow night, is really the, the demand, the growth. So the total vehicle demands, demands of new growth, that's projecting that population of how much demand on the traffic they're gonna have, and then the total cost. The breakdown to the right is the full report that you're gonna see in, um, you know, in the second public hearing if we, if we move towards that direction. And just an important thing to remember as we get that, I said that 38, roughly $38 million number in service area A was really important. That is really important, but one thing that we have to remember is state law requires us to cut that number in half. There's a requirement in state law that says the recoverable cost has to be cut in half. It's just one of those state law requirements. It, what that cut in half is for is to recognize that future growth comes in and they pay taxes, so we're not double dipping, if you will. So state law allows you to just cut it in half, and, and that represents the double dip, if you will. Is that in half or at least in half? At least in half. Like you're, You have to cut it at least in half. Um, you could do a detailed credit calculation to determine what it really is, but the direction we went was to cut it at least in half at this point. So uh, water and wastewater are slightly different. Um, we went with that universal project approach that we mentioned before. For water and wastewater, we went with a project-specific approach. Instead of looking at the whole system and breaking it down, we, every project we're breaking down, and it's based on the master plan. So we looked at the master plan that was, that's been put together for um, water and wastewater, and we identified the 10-year the, the projects. So in the next 10 years, the total cost, this is the total cost, is 126.9, roughly $127 million. And these are the projects that have been identified by the master plan to be built in the next 10 years. Um, one thing to note, much like the right of way was removed for roadway, the existing projects based on the recommendations of the CIC have been removed. If you recall, when we presented in November, uh, February 11th, there were some questions about um, few of the existing projects, some of the existing projects are big ticket items, and there were some questions from council. Um, the advisory committee heard those questions and heard the feedback from the, um, the public that's been talking to them. They did, made the decision to remove the existing projects on water and wastewater. On roadway, the existing projects are still in, but on water and wastewater, the existing projects were removed. So what you're, what's before you tomorrow night shows the existing projects being removed. Um, very similar for the water capacity plan, uh, very similar, um, 97.7 million. Um, this is based on the water master plan for the next 10 years. This aligns with those um, very similar projects, um, ranging from some elevated storage tanks to um, water lines. How did you define existing project? Um, so existing projects are projects that are built. So know. something that's under construction, how does that? On the water and wastewater? Um, I believe under construction are still in there, or under design. The, like the elevated tanks, those are under, constru under design construction, so those are still counting as proposed. They're not in service yet. Thank you. Mr. Griffith. Thank you. So on, on the elevated tanks, those are, yeah, thank you for coming up. You said they're proposed. Right, because they're not in service planned, yet. They're engineered. Not, that's correct. The, so, it's, but it's not considered, it is considered a current project or not? 
we're calling it a, a proposed project because it's not in service, it's not built, and it's not functioning just yet. That's why we've included them as a proposed project still. However, we have, it's in the right model, correct? I do believe so. Mike. Everything's in the right model. I, I just want to yeah, verify I just, that. I was going to say, and the right model is going to conclude all the projects for the next five years that's, are figured in to the right model. Right. So that's, that's, I mean, that's how we do, and I don't know if Blue wants to add to that, but, but that's how the right model is looked at. All the projects that we're looking to do figures into the right model so that we do the, the flattening of the rights instead of having the, the peaks right. and valleys. But it, the it's in the five-year rate model. Absolutely, yes. Okay. Thank you. Good question. So similar to roadway, we break down water and wastewater. We do this by project. So in the ultimate report, and we shared this in the last CIC meeting, um, so people have seen it. We break down each project to what's existing versus in the next 10 years versus beyond the 10 years. So very similar, if you look at um, wastewater citywide, we're looking at 31 million for the next 10 years, attribute of growth, and water, 33 million. And this would be very similar to roadway. We'd be cutting at least by half. Um, by state law. So what's included in the report tomorrow night is just the total cost. So you'll see the 126 million and then the 97.7 .7 million. We're working on finalizing the numbers for the um, what's to the right that's included in the final report. So the demand due to growth then would just be um, a math, math equation? Yeah, we break down each project uh, based on the water and wastewater model, how much of that growth is using each project. Like if you take the water, the 97, $98 million over the 10 years, um, how do you get to 17.56 being based upon uh, growth? So the, the, the 17.56, that is looking at taking the population projection and multiplying it by a per capita number. So we're looking at how much water we're anticipating new customers to be using. And so that 77,000 people times a per capita yields a uh, average day growth of about 17 and a half million gallons per day to the distribution system. Same thing on the wastewater side. Um, the 7.62 million is the uh, um, anticipated sewer, the increase in sewer flow over the 10 year time period. Thank you. So for water, um, based on those demand projections, about a third of the CIP you see in front of you is for 10 years. That 33 million out of the 97 million is what we're anticipating to be the growth demands of that, of that CIP that you see before you have the capacity plans. Um, the formula, this, so I'll, I'll, I'll take a stop right there because we're kind of sliding into some of the stuff that's not on the public hearing for tomorrow. So I want to make sure I've answered some of your questions on the capacity plans, which y'all have asked some good ones in the land use assumptions. Some of the other stuff is the calculations, just because you're getting a lot of questions about the calculations as well. I want to make sure you see that in this work session, but I'm going to take a break here to see if there are any other questions on specifically to the service areas, the growth projections, or the capacity plans that you haven't already asked. Mr. Atkinson. Thank you, Mayor. If you just, I had a clarification question for my own knowledge. So on slide, yeah, that's slide 24. Demand due to growth for water. Are we using the local per capita water use number? The, so the, the per capita is consistent with your strategic water supply plan and what's in your water distribution master plan. Okay, thank you. And state law actually requires to look back at 10 years of usage. That's correct. So we actually have to look back at 10 year historic usage on water um, to calculate that, the number. Ms. Joy? You, um, <clears throat> at your first meeting on service areas, you came in and recommended two. And then after that meeting, you came back with four, and we're now at eight. Walk me through that process of how you got from two service areas to eight. Um, I don't recall the two service areas. We, we, had a, the, we had one of seven service area option eight and nine. Well, the report says that you presented the SEAC with two initial. Oh, there were two initial options. Not, not two. Oh, okay, areas. okay. Yeah. That's, yeah. It, this says 
two initial service area. Okay, that's a good one. Okay. Care. We have okay. two service area options. We actually have three to begin with. We really narrowed it down to okay. two service area options and we landed on the final and one. So, uh, how did we end up with eight service areas? Um, Can you give me the background on that. Yeah, we, we um, presented three options originally to them and then they really got down to two, seven, eight, nine service areas. And it was really looking at how the projects fell out and how the growth was falling out and what the boundaries were and to be in compliance with state law. So we thought that the, the, uh, the seven service areas were getting too big, and so we didn't have room to, like, if you grew to the southwest and happened to annex anything, you couldn't grow those service areas and be in compliance with state law. Eight allowed us some flexibility to grow and maybe okay. annex some areas in the service areas. So eight allowed a little flexibility. We thought nine was a little too small. Um, we wanted to, The idea was to get as big a service areas as possible and to be able to pool funds, because if you can imagine, as we collect the dollars, we're collecting, you know, uh, at most, at least 50% discount, so we need to be able to pool the funds together to be able to build a project. So we were trying, the goal was to get larger service areas, but being able to service areas to grow. That's how we ended up there. Okay, and then you talked about 10 years, uh, these projects over 10 years. Mm -hmm. What happens at the end of 10? Well, um, state law requires you to look at the study every five years. Mm -hmm. So in five years, we'll look back and see and actually every six months we have to report to the CIAC of how we spent money. So, and they have to advise us. So like if we realize like, hey, our growth projections were too high or we had too many projects or whatever, we can adjust it every five years. That's really what happens. So there's an adjustment period and see what happens. Um, if the projects are, if you're asking if the projects need to be built within 10 years, there's not necessary requirement to build on the roadway side because there's a recognition that you may be collecting potentially a discounted rate from what it needs to be. So there's no requirement to build. On water and wastewater, there's a requirement to provide service. So if you collect an impact fee from someone, you have to provide service. You don't necessarily have to build the project that's on the impact fee CIP, but you have to be able to provide them service. Okay. So. But that five years could be, it, it's, it could be more frequent. It could be more years. frequent. Yeah. Okay. That's, the, that's the, at least every okay. five years. Yeah. No, no, yeah, no longer. Any other questions to clarifications? Mr. Griffith. Okay. Go over that, Mr. Whitaker, one more time. On water, wastewater, you have a 10-year mm -hmm. uh, that you have to supply. But roadway, you do not? Uh, there's no requirement to build roadways because it's, um, there's a requirement on water and wastewater to be able to supply, and I don't remember the years, is it three years, within three years? There's a requirement to, if a, like a single family home was to pay an impact fee, you have to provide them service within a certain amount of time. On roadway side, there's not a requirement to build the specific projects on the list, um, but we have to spend the money within 10 years. So if in, we collect the money. In that service area. In that service area. So on roadway, there's a requirement to spend the money within 10 years, but we obviously, if, if we look at the projects, we're only collecting half the amount, 50% of the amount, there would, it would be impossible to build all those roadways in 10 years. So you just have to spend the money within 10 years on identified projects. In that service? In that service, okay. right, correct. Thank you. That's a good point. All right, please continue. So this is getting into stuff that you won't see in the presentation tomorrow night, as well as um, stuff that's not in the report. But we've worked through the calculation. And some of, some of the other slides you saw with the recoverable costs, um, which is the nail down numbers in there. So the top line is the recoverable cost. Um, so you take the recoverable cost, and we're working with Lou and his team right now to actually determine the actual finance cost. We've estimated that right now. Um, so some of these numbers are estimated. We add some financing costs because a portion of those projects we finance. Then we cut that in half. That's that 50% I was talking about. So if you look at the, the fourth row on here, the recoverable total recoverable cost of CIP plus financing and the 50% credit, that is the numerator of the equation. So that's what that is. That's the numerator of the equation. If you look at the service units below, that is the demand factor. So for, for water that's 26, I mean, for roadway that's 26,158 vehicle miles, it matches that chart you see before. And for roadway that's been equivalent to number of um, living unit equivalents are the, are the one inch meter. So that's how many we anticipate over the next um, 10 years. So then at that point it becomes kind of a, a mathematical exercise total recoverable cost divided by service units to give you the maximum accessible fee. Um, it comes out to $878 per vehicle mile and then $562 per one inch meter for wastewater. Obviously you don't pull one, one inch meter for wastewater, but it, it's the same, 
is when you pull the water meter. And then $576 for a one inch water meter. Um, we a lot of times get asked, what does that equate to a single family home? And there's an equivalency factor that we've been working through that's not in the report tomorrow night. Um, but it's 2.97, that's the equivalency factor for a single family home for roadway. So you take the 878, multiply by 2.97, so it'd be 2608 for, for single family for roadway. And water and wastewater, the one inch meter is the base meter, so it is the same number. So it's the same number. So water and wastewater is a little easier. We got asked the question one time, what's that for a 30 year mortgage? So I just ran this into a calculator just to see what it was and that's the number it came out. Just because that's a common question that gets asked after we show what would this equate to a home buyer. Um, that, that's just taking the 2608 and simply. So about 50 cents that. a day. A little more, 55 yeah. cents a day. Total. 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 Yeah. So if you did that for four days, five days, six days, you could buy a cup of, a, a nice cup of coffee at Starbucks, right? That's what we're talking about? Yeah. Okay, just making sure I got that. About 12 bucks a month uh, for roadway. Um, to summarize it up, because every service area has a little bit different fee, what I've been showing you with service area A, so that's Northwest Lubbock, that's that 2608. And as you can see, that's, that's kind of the middle ground. There's a few service areas that are a little bit more. Um, if you can think about roadways, you'll see service area H and G are kind of where we're sitting today in the established part of Lubbock. There's not a lot of roadway projects in those areas. And so if you think about your, your toolbox for funding roadways, you've got a, your, your toolbox for growth funding probably doesn't need to be there for the inner city because most of that's operations and maintenance. So when you look at service area H and G, that's what this number is showing is most of your needs in service area H and G are operation maintenance, not necessarily capacity project. Most of your roadways are built here. You're kind of getting to the point where you need to rehab them, rehabilitate them, overlay, you know, some of the maintenance operations. And so the outer areas are, are, are higher. And water and wastewater is the same across the city. But this geographically shows you um, kind of the needs-based assessment hmm. and what it would be. So if you multiply each of those numbers by 2.97, or roughly three, just for quick, that gives you a single family home in each of those areas. So um, just to give some comparisons here, and I'm continuously using service area A. This is the very similar comparison chart. If you recall, this number was slightly higher when you saw it. Um, in February, because we had ex right away in roadway and we had existing projects for water and wastewater and we defined existing projects a little bit, projects that are in usage right now. We had those projects in there. So right now for service area A, the total impact fee estimated is 3746. And we, there was no rhyme or reason behind these cities were picked. What I, the cities I picked were, I tried to get cities that had a college there. That's why Denton is there. That's why College Station is there. And then I try to get some cities from Central Texas and from DFW. I try to get a, a wide variety of cities. I obviously put Midland in there because that's one of the closest cities to here that you have. But obviously, if you have any suggestions on comparison cities, I'll be happy to add those to this, this table as well. But this kind of gives you just a feel of the single family home of where you're lining out. One important thing to note on these, these are the adopter rates of the cities. These aren't the maximum rates. Your, your rates that are shown right here is the maximum that you could access. All the rest of these are what the cities are actually charging. So some of these cities, have discounts applied. Like if you look at the one example I like to use is College Station, it comes out to exactly $5,000. There's no way a mathematical equation comes out to exactly $5,000. The city, that, that advisory committee and that council decided we are, going to, we are going to assess $5,000 for impact fees. And it just so happens they assessed 3,000 for wastewater, 1,500 for roadway, and 500 for water. That was their policy decision on how they assessed those. But the decision that they made was $5,000 for a house. Mr. Griffith's got a question. On the college station part, that may just have come from the math department down there. <laughs> <laughs> Something they can understand, right? <laughs> Obviously, I jest. I, I, I think you probably have taken this into consideration, but Mr. Whitaker, to make sure on the roadways, all TxDOT controlled roadways are, are not included in this, correct? So, TxDOT's controlled roadways have been included. They've been included at the city's cost participation rate. So when the TxDOT roadway gets built, the city typically participates. And right now we have the assumption of 20%, which is pretty common. So TxDOT roadways have been included currently um, at 20% cost. At 20%? So, which typically represents what the city's paying TxDOT to build the roadways. Thank you. Mr. Whitaker, you may have mentioned, I, I know you talked about college towns and the like, but why do you have Midland with 
twice and New Braunfels twice. On sure, it. What's absolutely. That, what's the, I don't see the, what the asterisk, I don't see the legend for the oh. asterisk. Um, so some cities do what's called a flat charge across the city. So if you take Fort Worth, for example, it's on here, they made the decision on roadway to charge 37.50 a house and they basically made it work. Not every service area is 37.50, but most of them are, they have 17. So I put one number while uh, Midland has a, has a different fee for each, they have four areas, they have a different fee in each area. So I put the lowest and highest on here. Gotcha. And same thing with New Braunfels, that's the lowest and that's their highest. Okay. So we talked about service areas a minute ago. And you, you talked about, you looked, I think it's seven, eight or, seven, eight or nine and the SEAC has landed in the middle. Is that, is that that's accurate? Correct. That's correct. So make the point again, you, you sort of, I think you danced around that a bit, but make the point again as to why we wouldn't do 12 as an example. Yeah, the, the idea is, I'll give you a little history about state law, because at one time state law said instead of six, it used to be three, and the service areas get really small. So it gets really hard to actually collectively over 10 years pull enough money together sometimes to build a really significant project. So at some point after 1987, I think it was in 2002, state law was amended to allow it to be six, to be bigger. And so the objective is, is that you're still wanting to spend money in that service area, so it's directly benefiting the project within that area. However, it allows the city more flexibility to spend the money. So the idea behind the SEAC was to get the service areas as large as possible so they had the flexibility to spend the money on those projects, but also thinking about growth, like making sure that, you know, in, South, in, in Southwest Lubbock that they could, if they annex, they can incorporate it into the service area as well. So it was a kind of a balance between growth of the service areas versus flexibility. And I, and I think another point on that too is as you get small service areas, you've got fewer homes, new development to divide in the denominator. So your numerator, you've still got large capital projects there. So your rates could actually go up because you've got fewer people offsetting that. And so again, you want the area large enough to be meaningful. If it's so small, we can't collect enough money to build anything. And so what's the point at, at that point? That if, you're, if you get your area so small and so gr granular, um, the revenue that you're going to generate from that is not going to be enough to build. So you think of a square mile, you've got four miles of arterials around that, which is $40 million. I mean, that's kind of our rule of thumb is 10 million per mile um, for a full built out arterial. And so now you've just got that one square mile and just the growth within that paying for that $40 million instead of spreading that out further into the six mile limit that's allowed by state law. I don't know if that helps. You start moving the numbers, and if you move both of the numbers down, the end result winds up being roughly the same. You reduce the capital cost, you reduce the number of people, it winds up being the same. On the right side of the equal sign, the same number. As both numbers go down, the net result winds up being the same. If you, if you just move one or the other, then you, you change other things. I don't know if I just totally confused you on that. Or no, not. That makes, I, I follow, I follow. So around 2005, we had a lot of cities, like McKinney, for example, which is on here, had 20... They had a lot of service areas because they, they used to be quite smaller. Now they have half the amount they've had before. And sometimes it became a financing accounting too because the small, you know, you have to actually track. We have to create individual fund accounts for each of these. So sometimes the financing side, you have to make sure you can account for the money too. Um, Mesquite was one that had 12 and they went down to three and they said that was the best thing because when they had 12, they were having a hard time getting p money pooled together. So they went from 12 to three. They had really small service areas to begin with. And they said the best thing for their program is when they went to the bigger service areas. So that was just some anecdotal feedback from other cities I've worked in. Do you think eight's too many for us? No, I think eight, eight is the, probably the right amount. I mean, that you can't really get seven. It pushes the limit of what state law allows. Mm -hmm. So you have to have seven would be the minimum. I think eight allows you to have the growth. So we're trying to balance really seven, eight, or nine was kind of where we landed on. And we thought eight was, I, I felt really comfortable when, with CX recommendation for eight. I think it's the right amount. Ms. Joy? Just looking at your presentation, you're showing either July or August for the council to act. Are you skipping ahead, Ms. Joy? <laughs> yeah, and there's a reason for it. <laughs> because it, it, I mean, it, we're getting closer, but since you started this, this process and now, there are a lot of projects that have occurred and finished. Are those projects included in future as opposed to what's already been done. In other words, we, we've been working at this, what? About a year. About a not, year? Not quite a year, yeah. but getting close. Um, for the roadway side, the decision was to keep the existing projects in so that 
hasn't changed. So like whether it occurred or not, it would still be in there. And we've kept, I think the existing projects on roadway side are pretty up to date. I think for water and wastewater, we touched on that a little bit. Some of those windows are gonna move, but um, I don't know if any projects have actually been completed that we originally had proposed. I don't think so. Yeah. I think the list still on there is accurate. Cause okay. we just, that if you remember the existing projects were removed mm -hmm. in February timeframe ish, I think February 13th is when we started removing those. So we went through that list on the water and wastewater side to remove in February. So it's been yeah, relatively and, and the question is simply, can we rely on, on these numbers? That, that's the real question. I, we feel confident in the numbers. Okay. Please continue. Um, so just a reminder, there's, the study calculates the maximum fee, which you just saw before you. The actual rate is really a decision of this, of, you know, um, the SEAC's working incredibly hard to come up with some of the tough questions to provide a recommendation potentially to you guys to consider. But really, my job is kind of the easy part. I crunch the numbers and I show it to you. Your job is the hard part of actually figuring out, well, that's the max that you can charge. So like, I'm, I'm giving you the ceiling. So that number you just saw, that's the ceiling. So after the May 28th meeting, if, it, if, it, if we move forward, council will have to consider the following policy actions. Rate setting. Um, and what percent of the fee should be calculated. So right now we're showing you, if you will, the maximum. You can adopt anything from zero to 100% of what we're showing you, what we just showed you. Should the fee be the same in all roadway service areas? That's the question to the mayor's question of why did different cities show different things? Some cities decide to make the fee the same, some don't. I think in, in, in Lubbock, if you decide to have, you know, if you look at the central city, there's obviously that's really low, so you may have different fees in different areas or you may choose something differently. Um, because the outer, outside the loop is a little bit different than kind of inside the loop. Um, should there be different fees for residential and non-residential? A lot of cities, that's kind of one of their decision points is, should we provide a different percentage of the maximum fee for residential? Should we provide a different city for the fee for non-residential? And I can tell you I've worked in a lot of cities and every city has different goals. Some do it for non-residential, they do a bigger reduction for non-residential. Some cities do a bigger reduction for residential. It, it, it really depends on where the city is and the growth patterns of the city. The other one is when's the effective date? When do the impact fees go in effect? Some cities choose to make it effective immediately. State law requires a year grace period if you have already platted. Um, some cities give a longer grace period. Some cities, the effective date is a decision they have to make. When do these go in effect? And then are there any other discounts that you want to apply or reductions? Um, you know, the three that I said in the rate setting are the common ones most cities consider. You know, what percentage should we charge? Should it be the same in all the roadway service areas? and residential and non-residential, but there are, there's a lot of other policy elements that could go into the impact fee ordinance for you to consider. And those are, those are city specific and goal specific at um, limited use in most cities. A lot of cities don't have those other ones. So don't feel like you have to have other reductions, but it's something to consider you could. Like in Fort Worth, for example, if you're inside the loop in Fort Worth, they decided not to charge an impact fee. They charged an impact fee outside the loop. That was one of their decisions that they did. That was one so of So it's like incentives for, in, for downtown redevelopment yeah, or something infill like development, some, something along those lines. Yeah, and, and we're, we're actually been tasked by the um, advisory committee on actually Friday to present to them what other cities have used <laughs> for options. So we're gonna be presenting them some, just going through ordinances of other cities and what some other cities have been doing so they can kind of get a feel for that. Um, remember the May 28th is the public hearing. There's a lot of options that council could choose for. They can, you can approve the study as written. You can approve it with comments. So for example, if you wanted to change something on it, you could say, we approve this, but could you consider, reconsider this? Could you do that? You can make minor, you can ask us to address minor modifications and bring back to the second public hearing, or you can ask us to make modifications and have a continue the public hearing on the same topic. So there's a lot of options that you can do tomorrow night. You can, um, and we can walk you through that tomorrow night um, and legal staff can help us walk you through that. And we want to make sure you're comfortable with the assumptions as we move forward. That's the goal of, of the meetings. You're not approving a rate. The final report would not be adopted. So the report that we're showing you is really the first several chapters of the final report. We'll finalize, and you can, when you read the executive summary of the final report, you'll see that references parts that will be in the ultimate final report that are not there yet. But you're not, the final report's not adopted until the final ordinance. So tomorrow's kind of a check-in point. And so this is the calendar that I think you've seen presented to you before. This was our current schedule. Obviously, one of the reasons I put this schedule up here is just so you see kind of what we're working towards, the North Star. Um, the schedule can change tomorrow. Obviously, if something changes tomorrow, the schedule can move back. We could keep on the schedule, but this has kind of been the schedule that we put together a few months ago. Um, I think we put this together around the March or February timeframe. Um, 
and kind of have been working towards the schedule at this time, but obviously the schedule's at the desire of the council of how we want to go. But we're right here in May, um, and we're moving forward. As you can see, we've had kind of four meetings with the CIAC. They got comfortable because we have to put the report online 30 days in advance for the public to look at. Mm -hmm. So when we put, when they got comfortable and put the report online and moved to adopt the report, they wanted to move forward and start having some of the harder discussions because they felt like those discussions would take longer to get to a recommendation. So we went ahead and started those discussions on some of the policy and technical elements um, over the last few months. And I'm proud to say that we've gotten pretty good attendance on those meetings. We've been having them online, so I think that we've gotten you know, 25 or 30 people that have been attending those meetings and hearing the information we've been giving out. So with that, that was the presentation for today. Um, of course, any other questions, we're happy to entertain. Okay, so council, questions for, for Mr. Mr. Whitaker or uh, our staff? Mr. Griffith. Thank you. Was Has there been discussion on ever doing the calculations by front footage of lots? Um, at one point in time, there was a discussion of other ways to do transportation funding, and I think Blue kind of walk through different things, but there hasn't been a focus of the committee or anyone to look in that. It was more of like, what are other options out there? And we had one meeting on other options. But other cities do that? Um, not very many cities do that. They've kind of gone away from it because um, the reason is, is because the developer pays for front footage. You have to actually use that money on that front footage. So there's not the flexibility in it. So the reason they've gone away is because, and you have to refund that money in a certain amount of time. So the city, if they collect the money and they don't can't build the roadway in time, they sometimes have to refund the money. So it gets, it becomes a much more accounting issue. Um, a lot of times what I recommend, if you were to move forward with impact fees, is if, if a developer does, wants his, if he's building a large development, wants his frontage to be built, he has the option to build the frontage in front of him and receive offsets towards it. He wouldn't have to pay his impact fee. He could build the frontage in front of him and not pay the impact fee if it offsets the right dollar amount. So most cities have moved away with a frontage um, city just mainly because the accounting, it, it becomes a pretty hard accounting exercise. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Weaver, anything from you guys? Yes. Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Atkins, anything from you? No, Mr. Sir. Mr. Keenum? Just, just to clarify for, for what you have to do tomorrow night. You don't have to take any action tomorrow night. Uh, we do have a resolution that would approve the land use assumptions and the capacity plans as written. Like Jeff said, you can modify that. State law requires you to take action within 30 days, approve or disapprove or modify. And so um, there's a resolution that will be before you tomorrow night after the public hearing, but you could delay the action on that. But state law requires something has to be done within 30 days after the public hearing. So just wanted to make sure that this body was aware of that. Thank you, Mr. Keenum. And by the way, council, just so you, you for your planning purposes, the uh, the second within that within the 30 days, that second public hearing is is will coincide with our second council meeting in June. It's on the 23rd. Ms. Joy, uh, just um, real quickly, um, and my question just went out the window. So, if I think of it, I'll ask Mike. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And just to clarify that, Mayor, on the 23rd, that would be setting the public hearing? The public oh, that's hearing. setting. So that's, I thought we had to have a second hearing within 30. We, we have to adopt the, uh, the land use and capacity plans within 30 Okay, days so if we hearing. adopted it tomorrow night, then we, then we potentially could do it on the 23rd? Yes, correct. Okay. I have a concern. I mean, just the, the calendar to me is, uh, the July 28th, August 11th is problematic because of budget. I mean, I, you know, either, either we need to get it done or we need to wait till, you know, after October or, you know, after mid, you know, after our first meeting in September, I guess, because I, I think, uh, uh, I know how much time we spend on budget and I would, I think, feel like it would be, um, it would probably not be the, um, best use of our time or, or, so we can, we can talk a bit about that, but that those are those are my just my thoughts re regarding that. Yeah, we we could definitely move the schedule back. We can't move it up any because of the state law requirements of advertisement and everything. But we could definitely look at different dates moving it back. Mayor, I was looking for a question. Oh, oh, all right. 
Ms. Joy. <clears throat> Are there any cities who I'm do trying not? Trying to fill time for you, yeah, so who, could, yeah, who, yeah. cities who do not include water and wastewater? Yeah, th there are cities that have a, water and wastewater is more common than roadway. More cities have water and wastewater than roadway. Um, but there are cities that just have roadway, there are cities that just have water, there are cities that just have wastewater. Um, you don't have to have, you can have one, two, mm -hmm. or all three. Mm -hmm. There are a handful. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Whitaker. Uh, staff, citizens, thank you for being here. This, uh, it's uh, 10, 57 and a special meeting of the Lubbock City Council is adjourned.